Good evening. How are you tonight? Again, may I have the privilege and the pleasure of coming into your home to visit with you for a little while. What would you like to talk about this evening on this anonymous telephone program? Uh, this is a program where we are intensely interested in the Bible and desire with all our heart that you too and everyone in the world, as a matter of fact, might become intensely interested in the Bible. Because the Bible is the Word of God. It is written by God. All kinds of theologians and preachers say, well, Isaiah wrote, or uh, Paul wrote, or Moses wrote, and they quote from some section of the Bible. And it is true, it is true that God used uh, humans such as Moses and Jeremiah and Isaiah and James and John and Matthew and so on to actually pen the words that we find in the Bible. But the fact is that the message that is penned there came from the mouth of God. Uh, God clearly illustrates this, for example, in the book of Jeremiah. Uh, how he, how Jeremiah's uh, wrote down, uh, that is, had his secretary Baruch uh, write down what uh, what God was dictating to him, uh, so that we know that when we read the Bible, the Bible in its original languages of uh, mainly Hebrew in the Old Testament, Greek in the New Testament was exactly word by word, letter by letter, what God wished. And therefore, we never take issue with the Hebrew or with the Greek. We take issue maybe with the translator, because the translator is not divinely inspired. He can make an error in translation. And many of the phrases in the Bible are very complex, very uh, difficult to uh, truly understand how to translate. God did purposefully did not write the Bible, so it was easy to translate. Wonderfully, the King James uh, trans, uh, tra translation, which we use in family radio and which is uh, used on this program, uh, is uh, is a very excellent translation, probably better than any other that can be found in the world. But this program is uh, therefore very interested in a great many subjects that are taught in the Bible. We have a question from a listener in the Philippines. He, he writes something interesting. He says, you know, uh, given the fact that uh, the church age has ended, will you agree that it's possible that Jesus Christ is already here in the world for his second coming? Well, we've got to be careful now. We have to be really careful. Uh, the fact is, on the last day, he will come and every eye will see him. He will come very literally, very physically in all of his glory and how God, uh, God will have to qualify every human being to be able to see him because ordinarily to see Christ in his glory would... Uh, would, uh, would uh, uh, would uh, uh, destroy us uh, uh, in just the very, very uh, wonder of His glory. How 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 that'll all be? Uh, we have to leave that with God. But He will come very visibly, and He and the true believers will be raptured to be with Him in the air, and the unsaved will be have to stand for judgment, and that'll be right at the end of time and the threshold of eternity future and and we don't really know what eternity is uh, we uh, use figures of speech like after we've been there for 10,000 years it, uh, it will s still uh, this uh, time in the future will not have changed that that is it is time goes on and on uh, uh, but uh, I'm not even sure we can speak of time right? because eternity is outside of time. But the fact is, however, that our listener in the Philippines who listens to the Open Forum program also 
is on the right track, that indeed Christ has already come. No, not visibly, not physically, but he has come as the judge of all the earth. Now, we can say, well, now, wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, how, how, how can that be? Well, the fact is, when we became saved, the Bible teaches us in clear language that Christ and the Father have already come to indwell the lives of the true believers. We read, for example, in First John chapter 4, in First John chapter 4, where God declares in verse um, 12, No man hath seen, this is God speaking here now, this is his word, No man hath seen God at any time, if we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us. And, and then he goes on in uh, verse 15, Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him, and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God hath in to us. God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. Now, we don't understand that. Uh, we uh, we uh, don't sense that we are actually indwelling God or that God indwells us, but, in, but that is because God is spirit. And we have a spirit essence, and God in his spirit indwells us, and we uh, already are totally identified with Christ so if we are a true believer, so that in principle we dwell in him. Now, by the same, that's because of the fact we have become saved. He dwells in us as the Savior, as the Savior. However, when we read the Bible, we read in First Peter 4, verse 17, judgment begins in the house of God. And, and from everything we read in the Bible, and there's extensive references to this, the fact is, is that judgment, the final judgment of the end of the world, begins with the local congregations, the house of God. And who is the judge? The judge is Christ. He is the judge. And therefore, if judgment is beginning, it means Christ has to be there as the judge. He is making that judgment already and pre preparing those in the local congregations for their turn at the judgment throne, which will occur at the end of time when Christ appears in all of his glory and we will visit those who are, are well we'll all visibly see him the true believers in their resurrected bodies will be uh, taken with him and those who remain here will uh, will wait their turn to stand for judgment and so uh, indeed our our listener in the Philippines has it correct. Christ has already come as the judge. There's a judging process already going on. And it's, uh, it's, it's very interesting that as we look at our modern system of jurisprudence, we see that if a man is guilty of a crime, he is an instantly brought before the trial judge and and found guilty or innocent. If he's innocent, he's let go. If he's guilty, he's, he's uh, uh, sentenced to the uh, to the uh, sentence, whatever is required for his crime. But there is preparation. He is prepared for judgment. He's put in jail. But in the meanwhile, he he. Uh, uh, there's a lot of preliminaries that have to take place as he is being prepared to go to to stand before the judge. And that's very, very parallel, a very, very uh, good illustration of how it is. The churches right now are being prepared for judgment. Uh, sin has become more sinful, and uh, the Holy Spirit is no longer there to save anybody. God is the Savior, has abandoned the local congregations, but, uh, but uh, uh, the, uh, the, there is preparation going on. Well, thank you, Phil uh, the, the, our listener in the Philippines, for that uh, question. And now we're going to go to our first caller on our 
telephone lines. Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, Brother Campy. How are you doing tonight? Very well, thank you. I have a question. I know you probably heard this question before, but uh, what is it exactly does the Bible say that uh, someone has to do to be saved, to have eternal life, to Wh be able to go to heaven? What, what is required in order to become saved? Exactly. What does the Bible say? What are the Bible verses that explain? The Bible, the key verse is uh, Romans chapter 10, verse 17. This is one of the most uh, lucid, uh, easy to understand verses. Uh, there we read in Romans 10, verse 17, that faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Now, we have to look at that verse very carefully in the light of the rest of the Bible. For example, hearing. Does this mean that anybody who is under the hearing of the word of God, he can begin to have a trust, because faith has to do with trust or believing, that he can have a trust in Christ. And when we search the Bible, we find no, no, uh, uh, first of all, to have hearing, he has to be given spiritual ears. The Bible teaches that he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Why is it, for example, that we can uh, say uh, uh, faithfully bring the gospel to a hundred people? And uh, 99 of the people, perhaps, uh, or maybe 98, or maybe all, but a high percentage of them hear it, and it, uh, and uh, they learn from it certain uh, facts. But it does not. There's no change in their life as a consequence. They've heard the gospel, but there is no change. Uh, it is because God has not given them spiritual ears, and yet there's one here, or maybe two. And somehow they heard that uh, word of God, and it somehow made an impact on their life. And they they don't even know why it did, but they just find that that now they're beginning to really want to do the will of God. God had given them spiritual ears. Secondly, we have to look at that word faith. Faith cometh by hearing. Well. Uh, uh, faith, you mean that I, I will come to believe? Yes, ultimately that is, but actually the very essence of faith as we study the Bible is the Lord Jesus. He is, his name is faithful, as we read in the book of Revelation. He, he it was faithful in doing all that was called upon him to do to save those that he had planned to save. And it was an enormous task. Our God from the foundations of the earth had chosen those that he had planned to save. We read about that in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3 and 4. And then he gave these individuals to the Lord Jesus. We read in Roman, in John chapter 6, verse 37 and 38. And then it was necessary for Christ to make payment for the sins of all these individuals because before he could ever take them into heaven, their sins had to be paid for. And so we read in Isaiah 53 that the Lord laid upon him our our, our sins and and he made uh, he he suffered on our behalf and then there still remains one more thing that has to happen and that is that this individual has to actually become a new creature in Christ and that's a huge uh, uh, a huge miracle that only God can do and all of this is involved in the faithfulness of the Lord Jesus. We read in, in uh, Galatians chapter 2 concerning this matter of faith. We read in uh, Galatians 2 verse 16, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law. In other words, it's nothing that we can do, no matter how obedient we think we're trying to be. 
as the Bible t- commands us to come to him or to believe on him or to repent or do any of those things, uh, that would be an effort to keep the law of God because all of those are part of the law. All of those commands are part of the law of God. But that won't achieve anything because we're not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of the Lord Jesus. And the faith of the Lord Jesus will only come as uh, as uh, we hear, uh, will be applied to our hearts as we hear the word of God. And that is the whole plan of salvation. And And we just have to wait upon the Lord. Now, in the meanwhile, God also tells us we can beg the Lord, we can pray, we can uh, we can uh, ask the Lord for His mercy, and God is a merciful God. That doesn't assure that we're going to become saved, but it uh, it could well be that uh, that uh, uh, we too could become saved just as readily as anybody else. So will you say that uh, just a simple prayer of our faith where we invite Jesus in our hearts and our soul? That, you know, without being well, right see, there? when we just pray, when anything we do, uh, you have to think about it. To become saved is an enormous transaction. You know, a lot of people just have the idea that uh, 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 um, uh, their idea really is this Christ went to the cross there he was beaten to a bloody pulp and and uh, and because he died on the cross the possibility of salvation is available to every human being and uh, therefore the only thing that keeps me from becoming saved is that I earnestly and seriously I go to the Lord and pray for salvation and and, uh, and 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 begin to trust in what the Bible says about salvation and so on. And uh, this is the kind of salvation plan that is understood by countless individuals today. And it ha- but it is a salvation plan that has nothing to do with the Bible. Nothing to do with the Bible. Christ did not go to the cross to die there physically to provide for uh, anybody's salvation. Anybody's salvation. Remember when he was hanging on the cross? He said, it is finished. And he was still very much alive. Very much alive. And, And then after that, he said, Father, into thy hands I command my spirit. Uh, the the task or the payment for sins had been accomplished before he ever died physically. Secondly, uh, in in when we look at the penalty of sin, it is not just physical death. That's not the penalty for sin. Then everybody who dies is is paid the penalty, and and God could take any of the ones that He wanted to into heaven after that. No, the fact is, the penalty is eternal damnation, to be cast away in hell forevermore. And uh, that's an entirely different penalty than physical death. So that meant, if Christ is going to be our substitute as our stand-in to pay for our sins, it means that he had to make that payment. That is... God had to punish him to the degree that it became equivalent to all of those he came to save spending an eternity in hell. That's tremendous punishment. And the only reason that this could all happen in the time of the cross experience was because Christ was God as well as man. Remember the word that became flesh. That is, uh, God took on a human nature. And as the son of God, as the son of man, as a whole personality, he was brought under the wrath of God. 
And in his, the fact that he is God, it meant that God could so intensify the punishment that in the space of the hours of the cross experience, uh, the penalty was completely paid on behalf of those that Christ came to save. Now, ahead of that, there had to be, the, uh, God chose those whom he planned to save. That's also known only to God. And so we have, first of all, the choosing by God. Then we have the fact that their sins had to be paid for. Can we enter into any of that? Absolutely not. Here, if I'm still unsaved, do I know whether I'm chosen of God? No, I don't know. Do I know whether Christ has made a payment for all of my sins? No, I don't know that. I don't know that. Uh, And yet I do read that there is a great multitude that are being saved today. I do read that God is not a respecter of persons. That is, uh, uh, God is assuring me that uh, that if I happen to be black or brown-skinned or if I happen to be poor or if I happen to be uh, a very low intellectual ability or if I happen to be young or if I happen to be a, a woman or if I happen to be... Uh, a, 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 uh, enormous uh, uh, something else in this world I have just as great possibility of having been chosen as anybody else secondly the Bible says he came for sinners and oh boy I, if I'm still unsaved I, I can quickly know that I qualify for that because if we look at ourselves honestly we're all by nature in rebellion against God and and uh, therefore I, I know that uh, I, I certainly could qualify for one of God's elect being a sinner as I am and, and knowing that I don't deserve salvation at all. And, and, uh, so, and I know that God is saving a great many people and I know that I can uh, express my desire to God and truly, truly uh, uh, beg him for that salvation God indicates that I uh, that I can do that and so all of this is is very very encouraging to me but I know also that there's no way no way that there's anything I can do to uh, somehow affect my salvation because I don't know whether I was one of God's elect I know that if God is going to save me, it meant he already would have had to have paid for all of my sins when he went to the cross. And how can I know whether he did that or not? And uh, so I have to wait upon God. But in the meanwhile, I, as I read the Bible, I know that he is merciful. And I, and I know that, that it is in the environment of the Bible that he does save. In other words, faith cometh by hearing, that is Christ. He's the very essence of faith, cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So I am going, if I have a real concern uh, for becoming saved, I'm going to really spend my time in the word of God whenever possible. And I'm going to recognize, uh, ask God to strengthen me in the idea that that this is the word of God it is super important and oh Lord give me a little understanding I know as I read the Bible I read so many things I don't understand at all but I'll keep reading and now and then maybe a sentence will will pop out that I can begin to understand and oh Lord help me to be obedient to what I find there Uh, And so I'm learning more and more about my sin. I'm learning more and more about the the mercy of God. I'm learning more and more about God himself and his salvation plan and and how I deserve hell because of my sin. I'm learning those things. But in the meanwhile, I'm waiting upon God, waiting upon God. Maybe he will have mercy on me. You know, when we read, you read the book of Jonah, and there we read the whole city of Nineveh, the whole city of Nineveh, we're told, in 40 days, God's going to destroy you. And what did they do? They sat in sackcloth and ashes all the way from the king down 
oh, the whole city, and they prayed, oh, that, oh God, may it be that, our, that we might be spared. May it be. They are not dictating to God. They know they don't deserve it. They know they're wicked. But God, in his mercy, spared the whole city. And that's a picture of what happens when God saves someone. We, uh, we, uh, uh, God may be, uh, uh, be merciful. It, it, it all depends on how it all fits into God's whole plan. Because the saving of any individual, now we have to bear this in mind, the saving of any individual began already before the foundation of the earth in the sense that he had to be chosen by God to become saved. And, and, God, uh, and only God knows that. And, uh, but that's God's business. We leave that with him. We only know this. I am not a child of God today, but oh, I know that I intensely desire that. And so I'm going to be uh, uh, becoming better and better acquainted with the Word of God. And I can begin to beseech the Lord for His mercy, if that is at all possible. But thank you. And I know this is not nearly as pleasant a salvation plan as uh, what is commonly taught, which is uh, taught by those who really are not trusting God, they're trusting their church or their, their uh, uh, creeds or uh, what man's idea of salvation is and that frequently can look very much more merciful and loving and wonderful than the real thing that comes from the Bible and uh, that's actually the way Satan op operates in the world. He comes with gospels that look more merciful than that of the Bible. And yet when we finally understand what salvation is, we say, wow, what mercy of God. Look what he had to do to pay for my sins. I absolutely don't deserve it and I don't understand it. But now we should go to our next caller. Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Dr. Campy. Yes. Uh, this is Andrew Smith, regular listener. Uh, is it possible that uh, the pastor should be married in the church by all costs? Uh, is it? Hold on. I'll be right back with you. We've got to pause for this message. We're continuing with the Open Forum program, and we have a caller on the line. Uh, go ahead again with your question. Oh, I have two questions. Is it the matter of much that the pastor should be married? Is it? What about marriage? Or uh, the pastor, the pastor of the church, should be married by all costs? Well, the, the, actually, uh, uh, marriage uh, in our country uh, it constitutes two things. You have to have a marriage license, and you have to have someone who is licensed by the government to marry people. And that can be a justice of the peace, or it can be a pastor, if he has been licensed, or it can be a priest, or it can be a ship's captain, or it can be a judge, uh, uh, and so on. Now, if you uh, wish to marry, and, uh, and uh, if someone wishes to marry, they can get their marriage license. Uh, as long uh, They can ask a pastor, if they're licensed to marry, to marry them, provided in so doing they do not... Uh, submit to any authority of that congregation from which the pastor is a part of because you don't want to come under that kind of a rule uh, any of that kind of authority but but uh, just for him to pronounce the marriage uh, 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 the declaration I pronounce you uh, man and woman and so on in accordance with the law of the land that in itself is, is, would certainly be a possible. Now, if I, I do know also that in this country, and I'm only speaking of this country, it is possible for if, if you don't uh, 
uh, don't want to be involved with a pastor and you don't know justice of the peace that uh, at least in our state and I don't I think it's true in other states also that you can uh, an individual who is trust, a trusted friend uh, can get a one-day license to marry somebody else uh, at one time a one-day license at least I've heard of that and uh, so that might be something that might be investigated but thank you for calling in oh, my next question my next question y yes oh uh, I'm down with Luke chapter 9 verse 54 in which book? Luke, Luke. Luke chapter 9. Verse 54. Let me turn to that. Luke chapter 9, verse 52. 4, 4. 2? 4. 4? Yes. Luke chapter 9, verse 4, and whatsoever? 54, 54, 5, 54. 54, okay, yes. 5, 4. All right, I got you. And when his disciples, uh, now let's uh, uh uh, let, let me start with verse 51 to pick up the context here. God is declaring here, And it came to pass, when the time was come, that he, that is Christ, should be received up. He steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem, and sent messengers before his face. And they went and entered into a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. And they did not receive him, because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. And when his disciples James and John saw this, they said, Lord, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them, even as Elijah did? But he turned and rebuked them and said, Ye know not what manner of spirit ye are of, for the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. Now, what is your question? Um, right there is uh, the disciples, they don't have faith in Jesus. That's why they're asking that question. Well, the, the, the issue here is that, uh, that uh, uh, the disciples uh, recognize these people who are turning their back on the Lord Jesus. The Samaritans in this particular village did not want to acknowledge the Lord Jesus. And the disciples were very, very upset. Very upset. Uh, and first of all, they didn't care for the Samaritans anyway. Uh, there was no, uh, no uh, uh, unity at all between the Jews and the Samaritans. And, uh, and so they, uh, in their anger, are saying, shouldn't we call down fire from heaven and destroy them? And and God Christ is using that uh, that oper that anecdote or that incident as an opportunity to indicate no no we do not come with the gospel to destroy people we come with the gospel so they might become saved uh, true if they reject the gospel. They are judging themselves. They are putting themselves under the judgment of God. But leave that with God. Our job is to love our enemies. Our job is to be patient in continuing to share the gospel. We, we understand that if they have not had their spiritual eyes opened, they're not going to understand the gospel, of course. And so they even may turn on us and slander us and vilify us and uh, as we try to bring the truth. But we never come back on them vindictively or with anger or with uh, any vengeance in our hearts. Boy, wait until God fixes you. No way. No way we recognize except for the grace of God. I could be right there where that individual is. It's only the mercy, the grace of God that I, that God has opened my eyes and therefore I can pray for that individual. In fact, the Bible tells us that we are to uh, pray for those who despitefully use us and we are to bless them. That is, we're to desire the highest good for them, namely salvation. But thank you for calling and sharing. 
And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Um, can I ask you a question? Is it a, a sin for a parent that has an artistic child, like a female, to get their tubes tied? Well, see, here's the problem. The question is birth control. And you know, this problem, there were no solutions like this for 13,000 years of history. It's in our generation. It's in our generation. It's the first generation that's come along where we can uh, uh, try to avoid a pregnancy uh, by birth control uh, and there are various ways in which this can be done. Uh, and and uh, we can, and uh, until this generation, there were only two possibilities, and one was abstinence. Uh, uh, or spilling the semen on the ground, or, this, or the other idea was, and this was practiced in some countries, that the baby that was not wanted was aborted or, or killed upon birth. And that also did occur from time to time. But in our generation, we can, we, mankind has finally become in charge for 13,000 years. When there was uh, 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 the intimacy of marriage, when there was intimacy between a male and a female, the possibility of a pregnancy always was present. But in our generation, mankind has finally how figured out how to escape the uh, the plan of God, because that was the plan of God that. Uh, uh, through that intimacy, there would be from time to time, if that was God's will, a pregnancy. But now, and, and mankind had no control on that. But now mankind finally has, has, has figured out a way to gain control. And, uh, and uh, uh, they really think this is serving them very well. Well, the fact is, it is rebellion against God. It is denying what God has declared, namely that we are to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. It is denying the fact that we have to wait upon God if he wants us to have another child or if a child should come from this uh, intimacy that occurs. That's God's business. But now we have taken the law into our own hands. And it's so commonplace that even amongst those who call themselves Christians, uh, they practice birth control and these other, uh, some other things of that even, and there are, uh, and, uh, and of course, uh, the handmaiden of this is that unwanted uh, pregnancies are aborted or killed early on uh, as quickly as possible uh, after, uh, after uh, the intimacy and so on. And all of this is simple rebellion against God. Mankind thinks they know better than God. And, uh, and so if you're a true believer, that's something you don't want to be thinking about at all. You, you just remember what God says, that uh, children are a blessing. And if that is, if you're going to bring them up in the fear and the nurture of the Lord, I like to put it this way. Uh, you know, here's a family of five children. Mama becomes pregnant a sixth time. She's really wondering, how can I go through with this? I, it is so, so uh, 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 straining on our family and on our finances and our, and so on and on, so on. And now I'm pregnant for the sixth time. How am I going to do it? And so one way to look at this is to say, well, all right, suppose God came to you, dear mama, and said, now look, you're pregnant the sixth time, and I understand that this is going to be a, a, a further load on you, uh, and so I will take one of your other five children uh, so that when this uh, baby is finally born, this new baby, you'll still only have five. Now, which of the five children that you presently have would you like me to take? This, of course, is totally fictitious. Uh, but 
uh, which one would you like me to take? And you know what the reaction would be. <laughs> well, well, no, no, I love all five of them. Well, uh, well uh, in fact, if one of them became desperately ill, uh, they're going to be asking all their friends to pray for that in that little one that uh, that uh, there might be healing. Uh, and uh, so there's your answer. You see, uh, from one standpoint, it looks like we can't do it. But on the other standpoint, we know that God has done something wonderful in our life in giving us those children, and we bless God for and uh, that here, even though it means we have to struggle a little more. And frankly, frankly, does God know about all about this? Of course. Of course. Is he sufficient finally? Of course. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Uh, sure, it does mean that I'm going to have to lean back on his arms a whole lot more. I'm going to have to come to a time uh, more frequently than ever. Oh, Lord, I can't do it. Oh, Lord, I'm at the end of my rope. What can I do? And I have to just just uh, focus all my attention on Christ to strengthen me. And that's nothing but healthy anyway. Those are some of the most precious moments you'll ever have when you finally come to the point you don't know what to do because of all the, the difficulties and just to lean back on God's almighty arms knowing that he will never leave you nor forsake you. Oh my, what a, what a feeling that is and what a blessing that is. But thank you. Um, but, uh, well, well, what you were saying is true because uh, my mother had like ten of us well, she, I'm sure that many times she was tearing her, her, her hair out with ten children. Mm -hmm. and, but, uh, but how wonderful, what a wonderful family it finally develops. And, uh, and so uh, uh, the world, you know, is under the, under the teaching of Satan. And Satan is the father of lies. And, uh, and the world thinks they really have it figured out if we only can uh, cut the families down. But the fact is, no, you have to do it God's way. And only the true believers will want to do it God's way. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, hello? Yes. Yeah, by the camping? Yes. Yes, I was reading through the book of Psalms, and I've been doing that for a couple months lately. Yes. Um, uh, David always speaks about, like, him, like uh, he has a lot of sins, but then he says he has his righteousness. And I was just wondering, like, what, like, I'm kind of perplexed about the book of Psalms. Well, the fact is yeah. that, first of all, uh, David we know was a child of God, a true believer. There's plenty of evidence of that in the Bible. Secondly, we know that he fell into serious sin, sin of adultery, sin of murder, and, and uh, God uses David as a to demonstrate how the sin in the life of a believer impacts the life of that believer. Now, if a person is not a child of God and they fall into sin, and they will uh, very, very readily because both in their body and in their soul, they, uh, they uh, want their own way about things, uh, even though they may recognize this is a sin they've committed, they will excuse themselves. They will alibi for it. They will, uh, uh, it, it'll trouble them a little bit because they do have a conscience. They have some knowledge of the law of God in their heart. But basically, uh, they can live with their sin and go along. After all, everybody sins, don't they? And uh, it's no worse than uh, the sin of my friend over there who did thus and so. And so, and so they rationalize and, and, and go on with their life uh, and, and are ready to fall again and again into sin. 
But when, when a true believer who has been given a brand new resurrected soul at the time that he became saved, uh, saved when he falls into sin, uh, it, it is a big deal because in his new resurrected soul, he never wanted to sin again. And now he is violating his own personality because even though he has a body that lusts after sin, that that did not change when he became saved, but he did get a new soul in which he never wants to sin. And so this troubles him no end. More than that, he has come to fear God. That is, he has developed a hatred for sin. And, And here he got snared. He got trapped into this sin. He fell into this sin. And it is a it is a mess in his life. He feels terrible. And that's what we see in the words of David. When we read Psalm 51, for example, we get the pathos. We get the, the, uh, the uh, uh, terrible, terrible agony of his soul as he wrestles with this fact, how could I have fallen into this terrible sin? Brother Ken, can I ask you one more question? Yes. Yeah, um, uh, through the book of Psalms also, like, um, he's always speaking about, like, um, I don't know if it's historical, but he's always speaking about the wicked coming after him. And uh, a lot of the Psalms are speaking about the wicked, like the wicked... Uh, can they be uh, whatever you know? Yeah. Uh, destroyed, 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 and they're yes. always after yes. him. Well, like, you what? see, the uh, the a lot of the psalms are uh, we call that theologically messianic psalms. Now, messianic means they have to do with Christ as the Messiah. David was used of God in the Bible as a type or portrait or picture of the Lord Jesus Christ and and where for example when you read a psalm and it's saying uh, that and praying uh, that and David is saying may the Lord destroy them may the Lord do so and so to them uh, actually it is not speaking of David as an individual because no human being should ever ever express those that terminology we are to love our enemies but it is David speaking as a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, uh, the name David is means beloved, and Christ is the beloved of God, even though he was typified by David, who was also beloved of God. But, uh, but those psalms are simply indicating that here is Christ, who is eternal God himself, And here is the whole world that are at enmity with him, headed up by Satan, who is the very essence of wickedness, who wants Christ destroyed. And and, uh, Christ has come uh, to to do battle with Satan, to to, uh, get victory over him, and also to make the payment demanded by the law of God that our sins might, uh, the sins of those that he had come to save would be paid for. And uh, that is what we have to keep in our mind's eye as we read many of these psalms. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hi, Brother Camping. Yes. I have a question about the... uh you had said a couple nights ago the Bible was finished in about the year 80 or 90. Something like 80, 90, or 95, somewhere in there, yes. And what I was wondering is in Revelations where it says no one can take away or add to this book, wasn't it uh, some type of the Nicene Council or something that actually removed books in like the year 400? No, the uh, any there are many many books that have been written about the Bible, critiquing the Bible, looking upon it as some kind of a man-made literature, and they've come up with a lot of different ideas. But but uh, that's because they don't really understand that the Bible 
is the Word of God. And we have to get our understanding of what the Bible is from the Bible itself. And so since the book of... And, and we do know, for example, that the book of Revelation, the Bible says so, was written where the scribe was uh, the Apostle John. And the reason that... Uh, that uh, we uh, we dare say that the Bible was probably finished uh, around A.D. 95 is because the evidence outside of the Bible, which is not absolutely trustworthy, uh, uh, is, uh, indicates that the Apostle John probably died around A.D. 95 or uh, uh, close to that. And it may, it may be true or may not be true. And that's why uh, when we say that the Bible was finished around A.D. 95, it's not a big uh, piece of information. And whether it was finished in A.D. 95 or A.D. 80 or any other year, it makes no difference. It is finished. And uh, the Apostle John did write Revelation. That is, he was the scribe that God gave the information to for the book of Revelation, and uh, therefore, uh, and the Bible itself. Uh, the way it's set up as God has designed it indicates that in the last chapter of, the, of that book of Revelation, which is the last book of the New Testament, right to the Right near the end of that chapter, if anyone adds to the words of this prophecy, well, I will add to him the plagues written herein, or if anyone takes away from the words of this prophecy, I will take away a share in the tree of life, and so on. And so we are on very solid ground when we know that, that uh, Revelation 22 is the last book that was written, the last chapter that was written. Like the book of Enoch, that was in after Revelations. Well, the, you know, book, the, the new new the, Bible doesn't have the book of Enoch. Well, we're, uh, what what book is that? The book of Enoch. Where do you read about that? Well, it was one of the books that were in a <coughs> Catholic Bible that my family had for over a hundred years, and and it was called the Apocrypha. Yeah. Well, those book those chapters were written, or those books were written about 100 and, or 150 years before Christ, and they never were a part of the holy canon. That is, they were not in the Bible that Jesus used. Uh, they are not a part of the Jewish uh, Tanakh and the Jewish Bible of today, which, which is very close to our Old Testament. Uh, the, their, the Roman Catholic Church did put those books in the Bible, and and they are still there, uh, apparently, uh, as part of the Bible, but they don't belong there. They abs There is no such a thing as div a divine book of Enoch, for example. Enoch, as a matter of fact, lived uh, thousands of years or a couple of thousand years before the flood of Noah's day, and maybe 9,000 years before Christ. And and uh, there is no, uh, it is recorded in the book of Jude, some of the things that he wrote, but that's because God gave those words to Jude as he was writing, uh, as, as he was uh, 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 writing out for us the book of Jude from the mouth of God. Well, I thank you so much for your answer. You've cleared a lot up for me. I do have one other question. Can Satan tempt uh, the saved? Well, he cannot tempt us directly. That is, he cannot come into our minds. We are completely in a different kingdom than he is. When we became saved, we read in Colossians chapter 1, verse 13, that we were translated from the dominion of darkness, that is, the kingdom of Satan, into the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. The only way he can get to us is through a friend or a loved one or somebody who is still a citizen of his kingdom who may tempt us to fall into sin of some kind or another, either in something that uh, uh, they're trying to get us to believe or in some action that uh, they're trying to get us to fall in. But Satan cannot directly tempt us. No, that's not possible. 
without me having to elaborate, you answered my question perfectly. Thank, uh, thank, you, thank you so much. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hey, Brother Camping? Yes. How are you? Very well, thank you. Awesome. Um, I just have a little, like a mini question. Why do they say Brother Camping? Why do we say Brother Camping? Yes. Well, I, you know, we generally like to address somebody as something, and you can call me Mr. Camping or Brother Camping, or you can call me Hey There uh, if you want to. And I, I like to use, I, I suggest sometimes, well, why don't you call me Brother Camping? Because spiritually, I am a brother to all the other true believers. Every We as true believers are our are, are, uh, Christian brethren, and and that would that's where that comes from. But it is not a title. I have no titles of any kind. I'm simply uh, a, a, a servant of the Lord. Right. We're all spiritual brothers and sisters, right? Yes. Yeah. Great. Okay. Now I have two questions. Um, <clears throat> thank you so much. Oh, hold on. Hold on. I'll be right back. No with problem. You. No. Take your uh, break. Yeah. We're continuing with the open forum, and we have a caller on the line. Go ahead with your call. Hey, Brother Camping, I love you. Thank you so much. All right, so I have two questions. Yes, um, something's really, really bothering me that I, um, you know, I was, um, you know, okay, we're not supposed to, we know that we're not supposed to make an image of Christ, right? Yes. Any images, right. So we read in, you know, Exodus uh, chapter 20, verse 4, and then it says here, oh, um, I'll read the whole verse. It says, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image, or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. So, like, is it also saying that we can't make any images of like humans? Like, like, what about painters and like paintings? Yeah, no, we have to. Uh, uh, the biblical rule is we have to look at everything in the light of the whole Bible. Now, when we when we isolate the words that you have just given. We might uh, uh, arrive at an immediate conclusion, well, then I can't make an image of a horse or of a cow or of a dog or anything. I just, uh, in fact, I can't take a picture of anybody because a picture is a two-dimensional image. But uh, then when we search the Bible, is that a true understanding? And we don't find that anywhere in the Bible as... Uh, as uh, 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 the, an understanding. What we find is is that that God warns uh, repeatedly that we want to make sure that we're not worshiping another god, and that is the context. Thou shall not bow down nor worship them. In other words, uh, we are not to make any kind of an image that, in any sense, represents God. Uh, that, or in our minds, uh, uh, that this somehow represents God's, uh, God. And therefore, we should not have a picture of the Lord Jesus, because uh, the, the Lord Jesus, uh, or anybody who says that's a picture of the Lord Jesus, effectively are saying that's a picture of God, because Jesus never ceased to be God. And that is absolutely not to be done. And uh, but to make a picture of a horse or a cow or or to take a photograph of people, there's no prohibition of any kind. So it says, or that is it. Hello. Yes. What does it mean? That it says, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. earth. Well, like, that's uh, on the earth. In other words, uh, uh, someone may uh, think that uh, the whales are very, very huge creatures, and maybe they are God. Uh, maybe oh. they, uh, they think that there's some underground animal. It's very interesting, you know, that in Egypt, the, the dominant god in the days of Moses was a cow and a bull, a cow a and a bull. A cattle, right? And, and a cattle, in other words. Well, now, what in the world you mean that... Those dear people of Egypt would worship an animal like a cow or a bull, and and yeah. uh, and in times past, uh, people have have worshipped all kinds of unusual things. And God is just covering the wa waterfront. There is no nothing, nothing wherever you look uh, that is that is to be worshipped. 
Right. So then it's okay to use a digital camera or like a video camcorder that's not contrary to the Bible? Of course not. Not awesome. a bit. Okay. I'm a, thank you so much. My second question, my last question is, um, <clears throat> I go to college and I was uh, witnessing, you know, in school, and um, I met someone who they are, they are like, they worship on Saturday. You know, it's a false gospel. And um, they're called themselves the Church of God. And he showed me a scripture, and uh, I didn't know how to answer it. It was in uh, Acts 17. Acts 17. Verses uh, 1 to 3. And what he was saying was that, you know, Paul, he went to the church. I mean, he went to the, 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 the synagogues, and he, you know, if you read, read, read verse 1 to 3, then we'll, I guess, talk about it. Now, when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the Scriptures, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus, whom I preach unto you, is Christ. He was, um, excuse me, I'm sorry. He was, in verse 2, he was saying that, And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the Scriptures. He was saying that it was Paul's custom to go on Saturday to preach. Because he was, yeah. you know, because because we have to worship on Saturday. I just, yeah. I kind of didn't know how to how to answer that. Well, the fact is that God had commanded him to go to the Jew first. He was he was a an ex Pharisee. He had been a Pharisee. He was thoroughly familiar with the Jewish religion. He had become a Christian. He knew now that we're to worship on the first day of the week. But in order for him to obey the command to go to the Jew first, he had to go to the synagogues because that's where they met together to worship. And that was his manner. Now, uh, he also uh, was, was uh, uh, brought into great trouble because of this. He was beaten many times. He was stoned and left for dead. Uh, he that became a thorn in the flesh to him because the, he went into these synagogues and they did not believe. They, uh, God uh, was no longer present there, but God had commanded him to go to the Jew first. And that's why, for example, if you read in Acts 13, there we read in, in uh, he went to the synagogue when verse 42 and when the Jews were gone out of the synagogue, the Gentiles, they would not come into the synagogue, of course, because that was a Jewish uh, church. Uh, the Gentiles besought that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. And that word next is a word that really means, well, it's the coming Sabbath. And when the, but, but we finally, let me go on a little bit further. Now, when the congregation was broken up, many of the Jews and religious proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. And the next Sabbath, and that word next in the Greek is between. And the between Sabbath that came, the uh, uh, Sabbath day, came also, almost the whole city un together to hear the word of God. In other words, there was a Sabbath in between the Jewish Sabbath. What would that be? That was the Sunday Sabbath. And, uh, and uh, that's why we read in, uh, in uh, Matthew 28, verse 1, and you don't have this in your, in your English Bible, but in the Greek, it's, there's no question at all. It's reading there, in the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first of the Sabbath, that Sunday morning, uh, of what was happening there in Matthew, 20, Matthew 28, verse 1, was the end of the, or uh, just uh, the, the day before was the end of, the, of an era of Sabbath. In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first of the Sabbath, that Sunday was a new era. Now, the people you're talking to, they are not reading the whole Bible. They have found certain verses. They've tied them together. And when you talk with them, and they're going to show you those verses, and you're going to be thinking, oh, my, they really know the Bible. Yes, they know these verses from the Bible. But they deny all kinds of verses of the Bible. 
that uh, would show that uh, they are worshiping on the wrong day altogether. And as a matter of fact, the likelihood is if they're Seventh-day Adventists, they ha it's another kind of a gospel anyway, because they are trusting in the, in the uh, writings of Ellen G. White as being inspired rather than in the Bible alone. So they're not even the true gospel at all. But thank you for calling and sharing, and shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hi, Dr. Camp. I mean, Brother Campy? Yes. Hi. Um, I about not uh, having an image of God, but... I, I'm sorry, would you turn I'm your sorry. radio off? Excuse me, would you turn your radio off and begin your question again? Um... Well, in Psalms it says, Seek ye my face. Is that true or not? In the Psalms it says... I'm not sure which verse in Psalms, but it says, Seek ye my face. Seek ye my face. Well, yes, the Bible does say that. Seek ye my face. The Bible says, Seek ye the Lord. Uh, the Bible says, uh, uh, Come unto me. These are commands that God gives. But the fact is that no one can come to him or will seek him in a way that is pleasing to God unless God first saves that individual. And only after God saves that individual can we obey that command to seek his face that is obeyed in a way that it is pleasing to God. And, and unfortunately... A lot of people read a statement like that, seek ye my face, or, or, or seek, me with, or seek me with all your heart, or come unto me, or believe on me, and think that, oh, well, that's what I'll try to do then. And they, and they haven't read, they haven't uh, understood that, that God is speaking to people who are spiritually dead, we're spiritually a corpse, and we can't seek his face unless God saves us. So when, he, when we read that, seek ye my face, and we're not a child of God, we can pray, oh, Lord, that's my desire to seek your face. Oh, Lord, have mercy on me that I might be a child of God so that indeed I can come unto thee in a way that is pleasing unto thee. Well, the question is, Dr. Camp, I mean, Brother Campy, is that it's very difficult for us as, you know, just human beings to uh, to pray to God and, and not have some sort of an image of what God, uh, you know, uh, when you speak to someone, uh, you know, person to person, you, you see the person's face and you're talking to them and you know who you're talking to. But it's very difficult to pray to God and, and try to pray to... I'm not sure how I can convey this. It's very difficult for me to try to convey this, but... Yeah, because um, you see, you see, when we... Let, this is an interesting comment you're making. When we talk to somebody, we like to know who we're talking to. We would like to take his measure, so to speak. Is he tall or short? Does he, uh, does he have an angry look on his face? Does he look... Is he peaceful? Uh, and so on and so on. We want to know quite a bit. Uh, or as much as we can about who we are talking to because this helps us to main control to maintain better control of the conversation and the same is true when people talk about having a god that they want to serve they want to be able to take the measure of that god they want a god that that uh, they can know something about and so uh, in idol worship for example they'll take a hunk of wood and and uh, carve out a face on it and paint it with vermilion and and scarlet and uh, and silver and so on and 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 put it in a very uh, holy corner of a building or maybe in a temple and they'll bow down and this is their god this is a god they can take the measure of and and the same is when people want a picture of the lord jesus they they uh, they're They'll say, "Oh, we don't worship that picture." No, of course not. But you, you, uh, you wouldn't do that. But on the other hand, the very fact 
that you want that picture of Jesus on the wall, knowing that he, that Jesus is God, indicates you want a God that you can really take the measure of. He is, he looks like me, like a fellow human being, and uh, that's someone that I can deal with. That is a situation I can deal with. But the fact is that Christ uh, told the Samaritan woman, for example, in Acts 4, God is spirit, or Acts 2, I guess it was. Uh, God, no, uh, uh, well, there's some place in Acts. Uh, God is spirit, and they who worship him, worship him in spirit and truth. Oh, well, can I see a spiritual being? Absolutely not. And who is God? Well, he's his, the, his infinite majesty who spoke and brought this whole creation into being. So can I uh, have it in my mind's eye what he looks like? Absolutely not. There's nothing I can have in my mind's eye as to what he looks like. All I know is that he is. He is eternal God. And, and, and I have to very humbly uh, uh, worship him and serve him on that level. And I can't have my way in wanting to bring him down to uh, the uh, level where I can take the measure of him, I can see him, uh, as uh, as uh, we like to say, uh, I, I can pray a lot more easily to him if I can em envision what he looks like. What that really means is uh, I can take the measure of him. I, I know who I'm dealing with a whole lot better. And uh, the fact is, no, no, we're the creature. We're nothing. We are, we have no wisdom. We are in, uh, by nature, in rebellion against God. And God is His infinite majesty, the judge of all the earth. He is King of kings and Lord of lords. He's from everlasting past. He spoke and brought this universe into existence. Why? He is that great and enormous being that, and, and uh, just think, I dare to call on him and say, God have mercy on me. I dare to address him as Father, Father. Oh, uh, is it possible that I too might have a, uh, become a child of God or I need help and so on. And so we stand very humbled before him. Very humbled. We, we know you know, we're nothing, and yet uh, we stand amazed that we can address him. But thank you for calling and sharing, and shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Uh, hello, Brother Camping. Um, I actually have two questions and comments related on two earlier calls. Um, well, I understand that we're not supposed to uh, worship in any image of, of God or, or Christ, but how do you handle the fact that there are museums everywhere and that if you go to college and you study art history, there are graven Im images of, of Christ. There's, um, you know, mother and child. There, there are sculptures. There's, there's so many different things. How are we supposed to approach that? Um, if you are an art history student, let's say, or or just you walk into a church um, in any country where there are, um, you know, very specific types of architecture, and you're an architectural student. Well, um, the, the, fact, hello? the fact is, as we witness those things, we recognize the the uh, unbelief of man in that they dared uh, to do this. If you go into the Sistine Chapel, for example, in Italy. And on this, uh, the ceiling, the beautiful paintings there of, uh, who was it, um, uh, I, I forget his name, right? Uh, Michelangelo. Uh, Michelangelo. Uh, and they are highly revealed, revered, and highly guarded, uh, regarded. And if, if I went into that chapel, I'd look up and say, isn't it terrible how mankind has tried to make God, bring God down to man, by painting some kind of beautiful picture up there. That's no more a picture of God or representation of God than, than uh, you know, anything else is, a fly speck is or anything else is. It, 
we are not to do that and and so it simply uh, should fill us with sorrow that uh, that this is what man has tried to do with God but we're never to look with, at these things with respect or with uh, with the idea that uh, this was something wonderful in its day. Hello. Yes. Hello. Oh, and I also have an, another comment. Um, you've actually mentioned this a couple of times that when people question what is the correct meaning of the Sabbath, should we worship on Saturday or Sunday, and you you always bring up the fact that in the Greek translation. Um, it would be very clear to understand that it means between Sabbaths, which would then mean Sunday, and then I forget what's your other reason for um, another incident uh, when, they, when the Sabbath is brought up. But if you don't know Greek and you don't even studied it, how would you know that? And also, are there other incidents in the, the Bible that is supposed to be the Word of God, and we're supposed to trust this as our sole... Um, um, well, actually, well, actually it, it is a mystery to me why God allowed the translators to uh, make these errors with the word Sabbath in the English language, uh, beginning with the King James Bible, which ordinarily is such a trustworthy translation, and yet in many places in the King James Bible where we find uh, the word uh, Sabbath, they have uh, done a very poor job of translating. And, uh, and virtually every one of the other, uh, uh, other editions of the Bible or translations of the Bible have followed suit. And I often wondered about that. And uh, it, uh, it, it, the, the amazing thing was, even though those errors had been made, the church fundamentally has understood that Sunday is the Sabbath on which we are to worship, not on Saturday. It's only a, a, a very tiny percentage of those who call themselves Christian who insist that we are to worship on Saturday. And dominantly, it's a church like uh, the Seventh-day Adventists, which, uh, which are trusting in, in uh, the visions of Ellen G. White as part of their of their divine authority and and but dominantly uh, the Sunday Sabbath has been the day of worship and the church had that right even though in the translation of the Bible they did not uh, they did not do a very good job of that trans of translation now in our day however we. God has, we're living in that day when God is, is revealing more things from the Bible to us, and amongst other things, we have discovered these errors, and, and so we can quickly make correction and find out, yes, the church did it correctly. Uh, most, most denominations uh, throughout the history of the New Testament worship correctly on the first day of the week. Other than you as being our source of, of Greek, uh, the knowledge of Greek, how else would we know this if we didn't have you as our source? Well, but you see, the task of every pastor, of every Bible teacher, is to go back to the original languages and check the translation. If, the, if a person is a competent Bible teacher, he should do that. Now, that takes a lot of hard work. and and a lot of time uh, frequently to do that and and then particularly if you're going to uh, to uh, see how that verse fits or those, those words fit elsewhere in the bible and so on and so most most pastors and even theologians don't bother to do all that they simply take the word of someone else and 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 uh, don't personally check that out now it happens to be that in our day God has laid it on my heart and the heart of others that that are, are that we want to double check these things, and so we do spend time in the Word of God. And God happened also in His mercy uh, to uh, not only lay that on my heart, but also give me a a forum, a, a me means by which I can share that with the general population. And that's just the mercy of God. If it had not been me, it would have been someone else. 
because God, that happens to be God's plan for today. But thank okay. you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello. Yes. Hello. Yes. Yes, Brother Camping? Yes. I have a question. Yes. I'm a born again Christian, and uh, I, my, a friend, I'll go real quick because I know time is almost, almost over for the, meet, for the open forum. But my friends are going to have a New Year's party. They don't drink or anything like that, but they do get together and dance. And I was wondering as a Christian, should I be in that kind of environment? Well, you know, that's the environment of the world. In other words, dancing is. Uh, uh, and uh, and uh, unfortunately, there are ma two major kinds of dancing that are, are going on today. One is uh, uh, the body movement dancing where there's a lot of uh, suggestive uh, sexual uh, movement going on, which is enormously bad. Or if there is ballroom dancing, which is the old style, uh, a man, if he's just with his wife, okay, that's all right, uh, uh, because you can have your wife in your arms, and you certainly can uh, can move around together on a on a dance floor. But in the normal situation is that, but then someone else wants to dance with this lady, or uh, or you want to dance with another lady over there, and the next thing you have another woman in your arms, and now. You are all together in rebellion against God because you have no business uh, being in having any kind of a romantic embrace with uh, someone who is not your wife. And so the whole business and even the music that is used did not come. It is not God glorifying. It comes right out of the hearts of people who are not children of God at all. And so, uh, why would you want to be there? Why would you want to be there? You're, you're, uh, you're going to be unhappy because you don't want, you don't like what you're seeing, and uh, and uh, you're, it's if if there's any way to avoid it, avoid it. At least that's what I would do. Thank you very much. God bless you, Brother Campion. You have me. I knew my answer, but you just know, just rubbed it in. Thanks a lot. Bye. Thank you for calling and sharing, and shall we take our last call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello? Yes, good evening. Yeah, Mr. Camping, what, where in the Bible does it say, what, are you, what, what I'm just referring to the last call, you're, you're talking about dancing, I'm just, you talked about two different kinds, and I suppose the two kinds were the ballroom style and the, and the suggestive kind, I'm just wondering... Um, you seem to suggest that even ballroom dancing could lead to some kind of untoward behavior. In, in First Corinthians chapter seven, verse one. First Corinthians chapter seven, verse one. God commands or, or makes this statement, and it is really a command. It is good for a man not to touch a woman. Uh, uh, nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife. And that gets right into the subject, but I, <laughs> we've run out of time. I'm sorry. Until our next open forum, may the Lord richly bless you. Good night.